We study through books of the Bible here at the Village Chapel, and we do have some extra copies. I've got somebody in the back with a stack of them, and somebody up front here as well. If you'd like one to follow along, just raise your hand up real high. We'll be in Acts chapter 6 today, 15 verses, and um, we're picking up on the storyline of the birth of the church, the wildfire-like spread of the gospel around the Mediterranean region. Uh, For now, we're still sort of focused in Jerusalem, and uh, we have seen that uh, thousands have been added to the church, Uh, well over 5,000 at this point, could be 10, we don't know exactly how many, but uh, started with 120, went 3,000, then went and added 5,000 more, so certainly we're, we're somewhere in that Five to 10,000, 15,000 range at this point. A lot of people coming to faith in Christ uh, right there in the middle of Jerusalem. Our New Testament has these three contexts. The political context is Roman. The um, cultural context is Greek. And uh, you'll see that referenced here in this passage. And then the religious context for much of what happens in New Testament writing will be Jewish. So we're going to be keeping that in mind as we go through this. Now, um, Peter and John, some of the apostles, have been dragged before the religious authorities of their time. They've been told to be quiet, to shut up, not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore. Uh, They seem to ignore that uh, command from men in favor of the command from God. Uh, Jesus told them to go into the world and preach the gospel. So that's what they're doing. Now they've had at least two encounters with this religious council called the Sanhedrin. And uh, on the second one, the Sanhedrin ordered them flogged. So we didn't gloss over that. Uh, it was at the end of this last chapter 5, and, and a very difficult thing for them to be flogged. They left with bloody backs, to be sure, and uh, yet left rejoicing that they were counted worthy to bear shame for the name. And so we talked a little bit last week about what are we doing with the name and, and how, uh, you know, how, how would we find ourselves rejoicing or not Uh, as we either just get ridiculed here in our culture or in our time or in other parts of the world in which we live today. Of course, it's very life-threatening to claim to be a Christian. just depends on where you live. So we pick up in verse 1 of chapter 6. At this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. The twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples, and they said, it's not desirable for us to neglect the Word of God in order to serve tables, but select from among you, brethren, seven men of good reputation, full of, spir- full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. We will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. That statement found approval with the whole congregation. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid hands on them. And the word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. We'll stop there for just a second. I want to retrace my steps and just make a couple of comments, if you don't mind. Um, back in verse 1 there, Uh, What we have here is sort of, as this church is growing fast numerically, what's happening is uh, there there will be needs that will arise and they'll fall through the cracks unless the church gets organized. Now, I know a lot of people in the world in which we live and in Western culture will say something like, I hate organized religion. I just can't stand organized religion. They might even say, I like Jesus, I just don't like organized religion. And I'm here today, if I were going to title my sermon, I'd say, why I like organized religion. And uh, just enough of a rebel in me to want to say that. But I think when people say they don't like organized religion, I don't think they mean they don't like that there's organization going on. I think what they are doing is sort of transferring from organized religion, they're transferring that over to their idea, their concept of some smug, self-righteous moralism that comes sometimes from people who call themselves religious. Now, I don't like that either, so I'll agree with them on that, but I got to tell you, I love organized religion when it just gets right down to organized religion. Because of organized religion, these lights will stay on next month. Because of organized religion, your chair will be in the same place next week. Because of organized religion, the coffee machine will be working next week. Can I get an amen? Amen. Now, we all like organized religion, don't we? Yeah, because we like that stuff and the benefits of that stuff. But because of organized religion as well, we are able to say that we can step up to the plate and support Agape International Ministries in Cambodia. And 
join them in their work as they seek to save children from human trafficking and sex, tra sex trade in, in, in uh, Cambodia, which is horrible. Because of organized, because we're organized here, we have things like a budget, and we, we know that we can give to missions, 40 different missions organizations. And this is good. We need to be organized that way. So I think people that say, I hate organized religion are just doing a little bit of lazy thinking, and they need to actually kind of cut to the heart of what they're really against and what they really sort of rubs them the wrong way. And I got to say, I think moralism and self-righteousness rub Jesus the wrong way. The only people Jesus really excoriated and scolded while he was walking the planet were the self-righteous religious people, the ones who pretended to be one thing but were another. And that's why we saw with Ananias and Sapphira, we saw as this church is growing, getting up on its feet, we saw God said, no pretending, no faking it. And he said that through the event that we studied in chapter 5 at the beginning of the chapter. And uh, so God wants us to be honest with God and come before Him humbly as sinners that are repenting sinners. Um, that doesn't mean that we sort of presume upon His grace and just sort of have this lawless sort of lifestyle because after all, He died to save, paid the price for my sins. I can just live as recklessly as I want to. It doesn't matter. That's not at all. As a matter of fact, when you've received His grace, the one thing it does is it changes your affections. It starts to turn you inside out, and the things that so charmed you before don't charm you as much anymore because you're so amazed at His grace. And you begin, want, you want to live, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And so you find that He begins to transform and change you and turns you inside out. So here, these, uh, as this church gets up and growing, it's got this vast number of people that are coming in because they've been steeped in religion and rule following, and here comes the message of the gospel, the message of grace, but as the numbers increase, so do the needs, and so does the need for them to be organized. And so the Hellenistic Jews, those who come from probably around the Mediterranean, have moved back into Jerusalem, and they're Hellenistic, that's a cultural term. What that means is they probably spoke Greek instead of Aramaic. Aramaic would have been the primary language in Israel at the time. Aramaic is sort of a hybrid between ancient Hebrew and Greek. It's kind of a Hellenized version of Hebrew. So these folks are coming back in, and they're speaking Greek, and they're coming into a circle of people that are already there, a lot of the folks that have grown up in Jerusalem, in and around Israel, and they are the sort of the Hebrew Jews or the, the Hebrews that are there as it's, as it's uh, written there in verse number one. And the Hellenistic Jews, their widows weren't being served when it came to the distribution of food, and so they brought this complaint before to the apostles. I think it's really a very natural thing to happen when an organization is growing. Some of you are in business, you understand what it means when your organization is growing, and problems arise, and then you respond to those problems. We've had this exact same situation here at our church. Um, you know, there are people that think, hey, you know, uh, I was just over at East Nashville, for instance, there are people that are over there that used to go here, and they're going, yeah, I was with this when we were back in Hillsborough Village, you know. And then there are others that are here in this room probably that were with us when we were in the hotel in Green Hills. Anybody with us in the hotel in Green Hills? Ooh, look at you. Yeah. All right, there's about seven of you. That's great. There's seven of you left. That's good. Awesome. But sometimes you kind of think, hey, we're, for, we're, the, we're the hometown kids, you know. These other ones are coming in. And so you can just kind of see how you get into a flow. You get to doing things the way that you're used to doing. You got a rhythm going. And some people get overlooked. That's exactly what happened here. And so they just came up with some really great, very practical ways to deal with this thing. We'll talk about it a little bit more in just a minute. Verse 8, there's a little bit of a change there. Uh, verse 7 is one of Luke's summary statements. The Word of God kept on spreading. The number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. Great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. I've got to stop there and say something about that for just a second. Okay, so does it not surprise you that he even had to say that? I mean, typically, wouldn't you say, you know, that that should be a given? that the priests, the ones who are sort of religious types, they ought to be obedient to the faith. No, something miraculous is going on here. Um, Josephus um, estimated that there were about 20,000 priests all throughout Israel, about 480 synagogues. It took 10 Jewish males to comprise, to, to establish a, a Jewish synagogue. And then you had the one temple that everybody came to. The temple was in Jerusalem. And so, um, but one would think that those who called themselves priests would already be obedient to the faith. But what's happening is here, they're moving from being sort of just religious priests, following religious rules and ritual, 
and to uh, redeemed priests. They're, com- they're coming to the faith in Christ. And that's why Luke points it out in addition to saying the word of God was spreading and the number of the disciples was increasing. And I love it. His emphasis on the word is beautiful too because even with the, the apostles, we see them say, we've got to continue paying attention to the word and to prayer. And so we're going to appoint some people to take care of this very practical need. That's great. I don't think they're saying we're too good to serve tables. I don't think they're saying we're too good to be involved in benevolence. I don't think they're saying that at all. I think they're saying this can't be a one-man show or a 12-man show even at that point. 5,000 people is a lot of people. Most churches in the West have about one full-time employee for every 100 members in the church. So here they have about 5,000 people or more, and 12 people cannot possibly even be aware of everyone's name, much less everyone's needs. And so there's, they're wanting to appoint, but that's, that's a smart thing to do. I think it's very good of them. And uh, talk just a little bit about that in just a little bit. Uh, little bit. Verse 8, Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. Here's the first of the non-apostles, somebody who isn't Jesus and not an apostle. Here's the first case of one of them Uh, performing miracles, where God is performing miracles through them. So that's an important thing to point out. Also, I love his resume. Stephen, what's his resume? Full of grace and power. Oh, that that would be said. Oh, of us. Wouldn't that be wonderful and glorious? He was performing great wonders and signs among the people. Remember, signs point to something other than themselves. And so in this particular case, as we've been studying the book of Acts, we understand that the miracles and the signs and the wonders that are being done are being done to validate, affirm, confirm the gospel message that these men are preaching. So when the apostles are saying, we're followers of Jesus, Jesus rose from the dead, you should follow him too, he's eager to forgive you your sins, it validates what they're saying when they can see that this God that they're talking about is, uh, has really got the power to actually heal many of them. And, uh, and we've already read in the uh, previous chapter how some folks were so caught up in all of that. They brought their sick. They laid them down in the street hoping that uh, Peter's shadow would just fall on them as Peter walked by, just desperate for healing. So Stephen is the first of the non-apostles who's actually performing great wonders and signs among the people. Some men from what was called the synagogue of the freed men, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. So here comes dun, 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 dun. Little trouble, okay? So we've had persecution from the religious establishment, and now we're having some folk from the synagogue of the freedmen, and as I said, there are a couple, few hundred synagogues in and around uh, Israel at the time, and these were from very specific regions that are listed, and I love that about our Bible. It's actually uh, set in space-time history in real geographic places. How do I know that? Right here. Uh, They were both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and both of those kinds of people were from northern Africa. Cyrene is what we now today call Libya. Alexandria is, is a city in what we call Egypt. Alexandria will become a great center of Christianity in the years to come, in the centuries to come, as uh, church history moves forward. But for now, there are some who have come back to Jerusalem that are Cyrenians and Alexandrians. There are also some from Cilicia and from Asia, it says in verse 9. Cilicia is that region north and to the west of Israel. Uh, Saul of Tarsus, Tarsus, his hometown, the guy who becomes Paul later, he's from Cilicia, that region, okay? That's where Tarsus is. Asia that's mentioned here isn't, as we, a lot of us will think, the Far East. No, it's more the Near or uh, Middle East. It's mostly what we would call Turkey, actually, today, is what they called Asia Minor. So that's what verse 9 is referencing. And so these men from the synagogue of the freedmen are arguing with Stephen as he preaches the gospel. They, they were unable, verse 10, to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Now, notice what happens to him as we go to the end of the chapter. Then he, they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God, and they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. This would be a reference to the Sanhedrin, the same one that had dragged in Peter and John and the other apostles, the same one that had uh, uh, flogged them so that they left with bloody backs and they told them not to preach the gospel. So Stephen is being dragged in front of them just as Jesus was dragged before them as well. 
And they put forward false witnesses who said, this man incessantly speaks against this holy place, meaning the temple, and the law, meaning the law of Moses. And if there were two things that a Jew revered in that day and time, it would be the temple, which represented God's presence among His people, and that's the center of worship, the, the, the life of worship for the Jews. And so you're, if they're going to accuse him of something, even falsely, they want to do something really, make it really, really bad. And so they say that he's been speaking against, incessantly against the holy place, the temple, and the law, which would be the other, the second very, most, very, very most important thing to them. We've heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. In verse 1 of chapter 7, and the high priest said, are these things so? And we'll fade to black right now, and that'll be the last bit of text we'll take. I want to leave you hanging a little bit for sort of a, you know, get you to come back next week. See, next week is Stephen's preachment. It's like they open the door, and they want to know, are these things so? And then he preaches what is the longest sermon in the book of Acts. So I know you're going to be eager to be back for that, right? <laughs> and uh, since we're going to take that all in one big clump, I thought we'd leave with that sort of fade to black. Oh, no, what's going to happen, right? So, um, it's interesting, though, that so much of what happened to Jesus happens to Stephen. I don't know if you caught on to that or not, um, but, but there's a lot there that, that, that sort of parallels. But let me just take a look as we move back through the chapter a little bit. Characteristics of a healthy church, I think, are on display here, biblical and practical. Yeah, uh, they're focused on the Word of God. The apostles want to stay and remain focused on the Word of God and prayer. I like that. I like it that they're not separating those. I think it's really important that people who do what I do and people who teach Sunday school classes and people who teach children's ministry and people who go out and sing about Jesus and people who talk, uh, publish Christian books and all this, we need to be in prayer. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to confess that for me, the first of the spiritual disciplines to kind of wane in my life when my life gets noisy and busy, sadly, is prayer. I can do it on the run, I think, and so I do it on the run, and then my life gets noisier on the run, and somebody calls, and somebody tweets, and the little machine goes off saying, you have a tweet, you know? It used to be, you've got mail, now it's, you have a tweet, you know? So, either way, it's disturbing, you know, in the sense that it kind of distracts you from what, oh, yeah, I'm surely that's when I'll pray, when I get in the car and I'm alone and I can do. So, for me, I have to really carve out special time to be able to spend quality time in prayer with the Lord and to be able to, as I get before Him, be able to say to Him, Lord, give me your eyes that I might see what you see. Give me your heart that I might want and desire what you want and desire. And as well, that my heart might break over what your heart breaks over and that my heart might delight in what your heart delights in. And that only happens as I dial in, spend quality time in prayer with the Lord, communing with Him, not just bringing my list of things to do today, although He's invited me to do that. He's invited me to bring my cares and concerns. He's invited you to do that as well. But if that's all we ever do, it's like we're just walking up to a machine and putting a quarter in hoping to get the right answer out. Man, you, we are missing so much of it if that's what our prayer life is reduced to. We need to have a prayer life where we're communing with the Lord, communing with the Father and the Son and the Spirit in a way that begins to um, redirect our affections, our, our affections that have been misdirected, that are, uh, and redirect the way we think and the way we see the world around us. We need that desperately. Why? Because there's so many voices that are calling to us to think their way. There's so many, so many voices that are, uh, and, and, and movements that are uh, in some ways disp putting some despair uh, over God's people. And so, it's so important, I think, for all of us to recognize the fact that we need to be biblical, we need to be practical, just like these guys were. And I love that they were practical, they were and biblical. I love it that they focused on the Word, because then when that need rose up, <clears throat> and the widows of the, um, the Hellenistic Jews, when their food wasn't getting to them, you know, in the distribution of food, they were very practical. They said, let's put some people in charge of this. And then, you know what they did? They chose seven people who all have Greek names. Wow, pretty smart. So the need is going to be met and managed by people who have an affinity with the people who have the need. I love this. This is beautiful of them. So Stephen, Stephanos, his name means victor's crown. 
and he will be the one that will be martyred in another chapter as we read this. And, uh, and yet Jesus, whom he gets a vision of at the end, will stand. Jesus will stand. And, uh, and, and Stephanus, uh, he, he'll, he'll have the crown of life, even though he will be put to death physically in his suffering. He will have the crown of life from Jesus. And so, biblical and practical, I love that about this church. Were they perfect? No. But they... The need arose, and they responded to the need. It was a real need, a justifiable need. This wasn't just a schism in the church. It was just a group of people saying, we've got a need, and how do we take care of that? And so I love it that they took care of it. David Jackman is one of my favorite UK evangelical Christian Bible teachers and former president of what's called the Proclamation Trust, a great website if you like to listen to sermons by Brits. I I enjoy listening to Brits just for the accent. I mean, come on, really. They sound great, don't they? Somebody, you just, you just got to love that, right? So, but he's also, this guy's great Bible teacher. He says, gospel deals not uh, just with our alienation from God, but the gospel also deals with our sinful preoccupation with ourselves and our lack of love and concern for other people. And one of the marks of the gospel is that Christians are united in their care for one, uh, for one, one another is what it should say there. That's so true. In other words, the love of God should mark the people of God so that the watching world can see the gospel in word and deed, visible and audible, as it's lived out in relationships and community, as the people of God learn to love each other well, and even beyond that, uh, reach out to beyond our own walls and learn to love others well. The biblical, practical approach to the gospel is that, yes, it's about belief, but it's also a, a belief that influences and affects our behavior. It's, it's creed that turns into conduct. Uh, and it's rich that way, and it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful. That's one of the reasons this tag team video, just that's one of the reasons we're calling people to, to rise up, not just be observers, but to be participants in the work of the church here at the Village Chapel. Another thing about that early church is they were adaptable. I like this as we saw this. Um, adaptable in the sense of, you know what, okay, we need some people to do that kind of, they didn't resist change just for change. I mean, every time we change something here, you guys are pretty cool about it, but how many of us have been in churches where change is difficult, any kind of change, especially physically to the sanctuary? Oh my gosh, you would have thought you just started worshiping Satan because you wanted to color, you didn't want to change the color of the carpet in the sanctuary, right? Or you wanted to move, you know, the communion table. We're not moving that communion table. We are not putting drums on that communion table. We are not yeah, I mean, I just, people go nuts sometimes for their stuff, you know, for the stuff they cling to and hold to. The early church was adaptable, and I appreciate that about them. This need arose, and they didn't just resist. They didn't just say, oh, they should just figure it out themselves. They're adaptable, and I appreciate that about their leadership. Thirdly, they're faithful servant leaders. Um, I love the way that they're described. Um, you can see this up on the screen. It says, um, uh, in and if you'd rather see it in the, in the text, verse 3, select ones who are from among you. That means they're, they've already bought into the vision of what's going on. So they're not going to come in and create division. They've already bought into the vision. And those are the people you want to put in charge. You, wanna, you want those people to be responsibly engaged with the various things that happen. At our church, we just happened to do it this way. It, I don't know when it started this way, but a long time ago, we just said, you know what? If people come in here and they're sort of seeking an opportunity to do something, they're just looking for a gig, you know, to play in the worship team or, or to take over the men's ministry or they're waiting for me to die so they can have the pulpit or something. I, whatever it is, and I, I hope those... Uh, we we, we kind of put everybody through sort of a six-month thing. You know, if you want to come and you want to serve, you want to be on the Let's Have Coffee ministry or the Cup of Joe ministry or whatever, be here for six months is what we ask people. Make sure this is your church and that, that you'd come to this church even if you didn't have a gig in this church. You know what I mean? And then at that point, when we kind of feel like we've gotten to know you and you've gotten to know us, great. Then we, then we can start talking about responsibility and lead a home group or whatever it might be. But, um, but I love it that they were that way, from among us, good reputation. That means um, in, instead of an inconsistent spiritual life, these people aren't perfect, but at least they're in pursuit of God. And at least it's visible. Reputation means it's, it's something that people see. You know, they, they see this kind of thing. So their faith shows up in their life, and people recognize them as spiritual leaders in the sense that they seem to have a tenacious confidence in Christ and in the Holy Spirit and in the atoning work of Jesus on the cross. And they, they don't walk around 
uh, trying to, you know, instantly, you know, just always fearful and trying to figure out. They've got some level, and it's not perfect again, but they've got some level of confidence in the gospel and in Jesus. And, and so that's important. Good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit instead of full of themselves. <laughs> we all know some people that are full of themselves, right? <clears throat> the interesting thing about self, there's so many little hyphenated words with self today. You know, self-realization, self-actualization, self-absorption. You know, <laughs> so, and Jesus, what does he tell you to do with yourself? Crucify yourself. <laughs> deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. It's so different. It's so against the way the world thinks, but full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom. Uh, that means they have consistently displayed practical wisdom in applying God's truth in their personal family and community life. They remain humble, teachable, and learning. Um, um, they're more like a fountain than they are a pond, you know, of, of, of God's wisdom. It's just flowing through them all the time. And that's a good thing. I, lo I, I love that. Um, they, when they come to church, they don't think of themselves as a guest. They think of themselves as a host. Wow! What would happen if all 350 of you in this room decided to start thinking of yourselves as hosts instead of guests? What do guests want? That guests expect to be waited on. Guests expect to be entertained. Guests expect everything. You know what I mean? And what if we all turned into hosts? Wouldn't that be awesome? We'd just be like all over each other. What can I do for you? How can I help you? How can I serve? What, what can I do, you know? It'd be an amazing transformation, right? Um, trustworthy, I love that too, versus those who would take advantage of or seek to establish turf for themselves. Uh, come with a self-serving agenda. There's another self-hyphenated word. Ego-driven, don't think pastorally. They're hot-tempered. They get arrogant. They get huffy. They get puffy when things don't go their way. Listen, it's uh, it, it, even 350. We have five of these services every Sunday, um, and they're not all the same size, but we do have enough people that now it has come to our attention that some of you have different preferences than the rest of you, and some of you have different preferences than some of us on staff do, and so sometimes people will come up to us very, you know, every now and then and say, why do we have to do it that, or, you know, or why, and I remember doing that when I was a kid too. I used to go to the pastor all the time and say, why is it just piano and organ? Why can't we have the guitar once in a while? And then he let us play the acoustic guitar one time. We played like an Evie Tornquist song or something like that. Nobody knows. Does anybody know Evie Tornquist? Andre Crouch, somebody like that, right? So we did those kind of songs. And sure enough, people ran to the pastor complaining about that all the time. Ah, I can't, that syncopated music, that syncopated music, you know. They just, <laughs> they, just kept, they just kept saying how evil it was and how horrible it was that we weren't singing one of the good old hymns and all that sort of thing. And... And yet we were expressing, you know, the gospel in our own language, and it, it meant something to us to be able to sing and express, and it meant something to a bunch of the other people, but there were a handful of people that, it doesn't matter, man, you change anything, and they're just going to get all kooky and crazy about the whole deal. Healthy, uh, a healthy church, though, has these kinds of servant leaders, these kinds of people that are selfless, these kind of people that, that have denied the self, taken up their cross, and seek to follow Jesus as they serve the church. Um, I'll also point out from this passage, and, and we'll see it more in the next chapter, but response to opposition. We've already seen this. Um, uh, the guys have been, you know, grabbed, arrested, flogged, and they walk out singing this little eye of mine or whatever. And, and they're, you can't shut them down. Their response to opposition is, is not to, to, to sort of load up, lock and load, and go back in and, and shoot the Sanhedrin guys. No, their response to opposition is to be overwhelmingly joyful that, that they were considered worthy to suffer shame for the name. I'm, I'm blown away by that. That's, that's remarkable. And we'll see this with Stephen as well. Um, he, uh, like Jesus, a uh, bunch of people rose up against Jesus, argued with Jesus, but lost the arguments with Jesus. Same thing happened to Stephen. We just read it. A bunch of people arranged false witnesses against Jesus. They did the same thing with Stephen. A bunch of people stirred up animosity toward Jesus. They did the same thing with Stephen. They arrested Jesus and dragged him before the council. They did the same thing with Stephen. Ignored the evidence of God's imprimatur in, in Jesus' life, and, and they ignored the evidence of God's imprimatur in Stephen's life as well. Um, um, interestingly, both of Jesus and Stephen will, will pray that the Lord won't hold this against their um, the folks that were abusing them and putting them to death. Fascinating. No wonder if the Christians made an impression out of all proportion to their numbers. Remember, the Christian faith should have been shut down early on. 
It had religious people against it. It's going to end up having Roman people against it. So the political forces and the religious forces, socio-political and religious forces are all against it. Should have been shut down completely. I have, there's no earthly explanation for why we're here this morning talking about this. There is, however, a heavenly explanation for it. It's the power of the Holy Spirit on the move in some, some inconsistent, frail and faulty uneducated, unqualified followers of Jesus and his power moving through them is amazing. No wonder if the Christians made an impression out of all proportion to their numbers. Conviction in the midst of waivers, fiery energy in a world of disillusion, purity in an age of easy morals, firm brotherhood in a loose society, heroic courage in a time of persecution formed a problem that could not be set aside however polite society might affect to ignore it. And the religion of the future turned on the answer to it. What um, would the world be able to explain it better than the Christians who said it was the living power of the risen Savior? Henry Guatkin, uh, from his uh, early church history um, to uh, AD 313, it was written back in the beginning of the 20th century. Isn't that interesting how that sounds like it was written yesterday? <laughs> Isn't that fascinating? And yet he's reflecting back on the early church, right? And, uh, and, and, and so many years have, have taken place since then, but yet we have the same human problem, uh, an age of easy morals, uh, a, a lack of firm brotherhood, a lot of disillusionment, and even despair, I'd say, epidemic levels of despair in the world in which we live right now. See, people don't understand the cost of ejecting truth. When you eject truth, when you deny that there is anything such as truth whatsoever, you're really sawing off the branch you're sitting on. And all of a sudden, see, everything becomes permissible. If there's no such thing as truth, then human trafficking is just a preference. Domestic violence is just a preference. It's just one person who's more powerful over top of the other person. That's all. If there's no such thing as truth, I can't claim that that is wrong. I can't claim that something else is right, that it's right for us to stand up and join IJM or End Slavery Tennessee and fight human trafficking. I, I, I can't claim that if there's no such thing as truth, but because I believe there is such a thing as truth, and I believe God has spoken, and that truth ultimately resides in a person, Jesus Christ, I can point to Him and say, I'm going to follow Him, I want to do what He want, wants us to do, I want to give all of who I am to all of who He is. Now, we don't want to hold anything back. We want to lay it all on the altar and find our identity in Him, not in our jobs, not in our politics. And so it's a, a, a beautiful thing. And I think that's, that kind of supernatural explanation is exactly what happened. Lastly, a gospel community in motion. That's what we got right here. Word of God being honored, gospel being spread, increasing number of disciples. I mean, look again at verse 7. It's right there in one of Luke's summary statements spiritual transformation, people beginning to live out the gospel. And I think there's a difference between a bunch of people going through the motions of a lifeless religion and, and, and the, the kind of people who would become a living community that display a vibrant relationship with God. And so the evidence of God's grace and power is at work in their lives, and it's just undeniable. And that's, I think, again, one of the reasons why we're sitting here or standing here today talking about this is because they were faithful, they heard the call, they were faithful to the call, and the Lord empowered them to become His witnesses just as He said He would. I'll close with this quote from Melton Trueblood, The Company of the Committed. This is one of those old books I found in a, you know, sometimes you go in a, an antique store. I'm the guy that goes to the book rack in the antique store, and I try to find books by old dead guys that are, you know, smelly and moldy and dusty and have some smack of religion or philosophy to them, and I love to read those kind of old books, and this was one of those books that I found. The Company of Jesus is not people streaming to a shrine, and it's not people making up an audience for a speaker. It's laborers engaged in the harvesting task of reaching their perplexed and seeking brethren with something so vital that if it's received, it will change their lives. I couldn't help but think about the village chapel as I studied Acts chapter 6. I love it that as your pastor, I can stand up here and say, I see so many of these marks of a healthy church at play in this church across the five worship services that all the folks that come. I see the eagerness to serve. I see the eagerness, the hunger for the Lord. 
Um, and I, I so appreciate that as a pastor. Um, and, and, I, and I thank you for the, the grace that you've extended to all of us on staff as we've grown and as we've tried to respond to the needs that we have. And as you see needs, I hope that you'll continue to inform us of the needs that exist. And I, I'm not trying to open my email box there for just this flood of preferences. I'm talking about needs, real needs that people have. We want to be that kind of church where every knee is bent and every need is met. So let's do that together, okay? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this passage, all it encourages us to do and to think about. Thank you for, uh, Lord Jesus, the way that you come and transform our hearts and our lives, that you turn us inside out so that we're no longer self-centered, self-absorbed, but that we can become, as we, as we trust our hearts to you, we can become selfless and God-centered and others-centered in the way we conduct our lives, in the way that we give, in the way that we give of our time and our resources. Lord, make all of us, uh, turn us into your sons and daughters that we might actually begin to look like you. Our hearts would actually resemble your heart and that that there would be this undeniable love of God on full display and this um, um, unquenchable sort of hunger for your word and for prayer and time and communion with you, Lord, that we might, through those, uh, uh, those gifts that you've given to us, Lord, that we might be transformed uh, more and more, growing from grace to grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.